Good morning. Welcome to worship. We are so very glad that you have decided to be here this morning. Wouldn't it be wonderful if when we got left this place, we all got soaking wet? That would be such a good thing. I hope you didn't bring your umbrellas so it can rain on us really good and get us soaking wet. I'm Pastor Deborah Lerner. I'm a senior pastor here at Shepherd, and we're glad, glad for all of you who are in the room, and we're also glad for all of you who are worshiping with us online. We're always aware of your presence. I spend a little time every week praying over you as I read through your attendance, so uh, we're glad you're here too. If this is your very first time with us, and I think we have some first-timers in the room, we're especially glad to have you, and I hope you'll let us know if there's some way we can help you find your way here among us. We do invite anyone who considers themselves to be a newcomer to stop by our welcome center, which is just in front of me. You go out these doors in front of me and step across, and you're there. Go over and pick up a little welcome bag, and this is just a, a thank you for coming. And then you'll have it at home and you can remember your time with us. And we hope that'll be a sweet memory and you'll want to come again. It is helpful to us if you'll fill out the prayer and presence card. If you're here in the room, if you're online, if you came in a certain way, you have an opportunity to do an attendance card and please do that. Here in the room, fill out the little green card. And then as you exit, you'll have an opportunity to place it into the little boxes that are to the right of each one of the exit doors. Let us know that you're here. And let us know if there are things that we can be praying for for you. And just I was reminded, and I need to say again, if you'd like a name tag, write that on the back here. And we'll make you a name tag. Uh, we need to know what kind you want, magnet, clip, or pen. And we'll get you a name tag prepared if you want one. Our prayer is that you find what you're looking for and what your heart needs as we worship together. I don't know what that is, but I bet you do. So if you're needful of strength, our prayer is that as you leave, you will know that you can make it through the next few days. And you can make it all the way till next week and come back again. And if your need is for joy, then our prayer is that as we sing and worship, your heart will be lifted and your hands will be lifted and you'll leave with a happy heart. We don't know what your needs are, but you do. Some of those things will be met by the people in the pews beside you because that's our job as the body of Christ to minister to one another. But the source of all of it is the one who calls us here, Jesus our Christ, the risen Lord. All comes from him. He calls us here. He is the host of the table and the host of the worship. And our prayer is that you have a powerful experience of the risen Christ as we worship together. We begin each service in the very same way, reminding ourselves what God thinks about us. This is not the gospel according to Deborah. It's the gospel according to Paul from the first chapter of Ephesians. So I invite you to remind yourself, I am chosen. I am blessed. And I am loved. And that's true for each of the persons around you. So if you're willing to do that, would you rise and just put a smile on your face and say to someone, you're chosen. And you are blessed. And you are loved. And that's really good news. And before you sit, oh, I love it when you, when you talk to each other. The best part of the service is greeting. Turn toward this camera on the side and let's say to our, our online guests, you are chosen, you are blessed, and you are loved. And that's the truth. You may be seated. Our mission candle shines this week in, in honor of several persons, Bill Cutter and John Pointer and Tom Edinger. You may not know their names, but you know who they are because they're out there in the heat greeting you every single week. Thank you. Thank you. Would you rise so we can thank you where you are? We thank you. Uh, they're out there. They help you get in from your car. They help you carry stuff. Sometimes they even park your car. Every now and again, there are secret valet parkers sometimes. 
But I am reminded by one of them that they were called into this ministry and know how to do it because of Cal LaCour, who did it for many, many years. So would you also say thank you to Cal LaCour, who was our initial greeter. He's back there. He's waving his hand back there. And we're grateful for all of them. It just makes such a difference to have that initial greeting as people come in from the parking lot. Yes, we have a brief mission candle addition that we're going to add. And uh, the mission candle shines this week. This is a surprise for Pastor Deborah. In celebration of Pastor Deborah's birthday coming this Friday, August the 25th, from the SPRC, the staff and the congregation, blessings to you and may you enjoy many more yet to come. And we are so blessed that you have been chosen to be our spiritual leader at this Shepherd of the Hills United Methodist Church. Now settle in for worship as we enjoy our prelude. Good morning. I am Nancy Meaden. I am your liturgist for today. Please rise as you are comfortable and join me in the call to worship. I will exalt you, my God and the King. I will praise you. Every day I will praise you. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. God's greatness no one can fathom. Let every creature praise God's holy name forever and ever. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to church. My name is Ken Goodberger, and I'm the music director here at Shepherd of the Hills. I am thrilled to be with you this morning in excited anticipation of a concert this afternoon featuring me and my older brother and sister, Jeannie and Bill. <laughs> And they are here in worship this morning with us, along with Jean's daughter, Sarah, and uh, Sarah's three daughters, Nora, Jupi, and Evie. Will you help me welcome them? <clears throat> you're going to get a taste of what you're in store for this afternoon, this morning in church. Now let's remain standing, if you're comfortable doing so, as we sing our opening hymns. They are, O Worship the King, Christ for the world we sing, and here I am, Lord.
the Lord of sea and sky. I have heard my people cry, all who dwell in dark and sin, my hand will save. I who made the stars of night, I will make their darkness bright, who will bear my light to them, whom shall I send? Here Good morning. I am, past, I am Pastor Daniel Gomez, your associate pastor. Please remain standing as you are comfortable and join me in the opening prayer, which is also on the screen. Eternal God, we gather to sing your praises, to ponder your word, and to offer our lives to your service. Come among us with power to empower our worship, to open our eyes, our ears, and our hearts to receive all you give to us, and to send us out into the world, ready and able to proclaim your goodness. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Our scripture reading comes from the book of Jonah, chapters 1, verses 1 through 3, and then chapters 3, verses 1 through 5. It may be found on pages 859 to 861 in the Old Testament section of your pew Bible, if you'd like to read along. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Go at once to Nineveh that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid his fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Then after Jonah spent some significant time in a big fish, He came to his senses. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up and go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim it to the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out, went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city going um, a day's walk, and he cried out, 
Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on a sackcloth. The word of the Lord for the word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
How exquisitely beautiful that was. Thank you so much for that gift. As they were singing, I was thinking their family reunions are probably a lot more fun than mine. How about yours? (laughs) Would you join your hearts with mine in prayer? Now let the words of my mouth be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Well, welcome to the second week in this new series that looks at the Old Testament prophets. The Connections class is the one that kind of started this. They decided to study the prophets, and they're kind of entitling, there's our favorite prophets. And when I realized that they were doing that, I thought, well, let's do the sermon series and go along with it. And so if you want a double dose, if you want a double dip, you go over there at 8.45, and then you come over here at 10, and you'll hear two very different perspectives on each one of the prophets that we're looking at. I got to start a week early, and I did that on purpose so that I could talk to you about who the prophets of the Old Testament were. What was this vocation that they were called to? What did that look like? How was their role understood in the communities that they served? And we saw that they were persons called by God to carry God's word to God's children, either to the nation or to individuals. Usually if they were carrying a word to an individual, it was someone like a king, someone who had great influence over the nation. And those words often were hard words. They were often terrible words of judgment, saying to the children of God, you're really out of line, you have really gotten far away from me, and it's not okay. And if you don't straighten out, bad things are coming. Those were the words of judgment. But they also were called, these prophets, they were called to declare words of hope to people sometimes in their darkest times. So some of the most hopeful passages that we find in the Bible are found in the prophet Isaiah, and often they're directed to a people in exile. And they are so lyrical and beautiful that they bless us, and we know them by heart, and we use them in hard places to comfort our hearts. I talked about the prophet Hosea. I think most of you hadn't really heard about Hosea until last week because I think there was kind of a buzz about what Hosea was called to do after I preached that sermon. You need to go read the book and, and make sure that that was really the truth. He was called to make his whole life a witness to the faithfulness of God and to the unfaithfulness of God's children. And he did that by marrying a prostitute, a woman who would be unfaithful to him. And and so he lived as God lived in relationship to God's children. And today, as soon as I define the role of prophet, we have a very different kind of prophet, the prophet Jonah. And you may not even think of Jonah as a prophet, because when you hear that name, you think about the fish. And I will say to you, to the disappointment of the children in the room, that's the least important part of the story, <laughs> that business about the fish. Jonah is a prophet because he was also called to speak the truth of God, that truth with a capital T. But he didn't speak to the children of God. He was called to go far away and speak to the Assyrians, to the people of Nineveh. He was called to warn the mortal enemy of God's own children that they would be judged if they didn't straighten out their ways. How weird is that? And Jonah didn't want to do it. I mean, he really didn't want to do it. Really, really. Now, you'd think if you knew that you had a word from the Lord, you'd just salute and go do it, right? Because you don't want to mess with the Lord. But this request was particularly difficult. I was trying to think of a contemporary version of this request. And the only thing I came up with was this. Imagine a Ukrainian Christian person getting this word from God. Go to Red Square in Moscow and proclaim to Vladimir Putin and his friends, God is concerned about your wickedness. You need to straighten up 
and repent. And I don't think you'd find a soul in the Ukraine who would want to do that. That's kind of what it was like for Jonah. Because the people of Nineveh were proud of killing Judeans. Archaeologists found the palace of Sennacherib, the most ferocious leader they ever had. And on one big wall in that palace was this relief, this raised picture that depicted numerous sieges that were carried out by the Assyrian armies. One of them was the siege of Lachish, which was in Judea. And in this particular piece of the artwork, there are pictures of Judeans impaled on spears. And there are pictures of heads of Judeans, disembodied heads piled in a stack with a scribe standing next to it counting the heads because apparently they got a bounty for every head of a Judean they brought back. That's who the Assyrians were. How outrageous that God would want someone from Judea to go to those people and declare to them the word of the Lord so they could turn their lives around. Who wants a God like that? So Jonah went the opposite direction. He went toward the sea. He went to Joppa, which now would be the southern part of Tel Aviv, and booked passage on a ship going as far as he could imagine from the land of, of Assyria and the place, the city of Nineveh. We're not sure exactly where Tarshish was, but it is likely that it was on the western side of the Iberian Peninsula, the western side of what is now Spain. That's as far as he could go away from Nineveh at that time, as if he could run away from God. I guess he thought he could. But he discovered it wasn't that easy. You know a lot about this story. I'm going to kind of tell it to you in brief form. A, a mighty storm came up, and it was so ferocious that all the sail, soldiers were, sailors were terrified. They thought the gods must be against them. And so they all began calling out each to his own god. And when that didn't work, they began throwing cargo overboard. And the captain went down and found Jonah asleep down in the, in the hold and said, you have to get up and you have to pray to your God to save us. They were sure some God was mad at somebody on that ship. So they cast lots to figure out who it was, and it was Jonah. And they asked Jonah, why has this calamity come? And he made this remarkable declaration of faith for somebody running away from God. He said, I am a Hebrew I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. That's one thing he got right at this point of the story. At least he knows the God he's talking about. But hearing that that's the God that he served made them even more afraid. So they said, what have you done? And what do we do to get the sea to quiet down? Now Jonah immediately knew that he was the problem. So he said, throw me overboard. Just throw me overboard and it'll all be fine. He was more willing to die than go to Nineveh. Do you hear that? He'd rather go drown in the Mediterranean than say, okay, God, I'll go. He didn't want to save those Assyrians. Eventually, the, the sailors wound up praying to Jonah's God because it seemed like he was the best one to pray to. The only one not praying, apparently, was Jonah. And then they did throw him overboard. And that's when the Lord provided a big fish that swallowed Jonah, and he stayed in the belly for three days. And that's the part we remember. But when you look at the whole story, you realize that the word fish appears twice. The word God appears 14 times, and the word Lord appears 21 times. This story is not about a fish. This story is about God. And eventually, in the middle of that belly, Jonah prays an eloquent prayer. To me, it would have been more convincing if he had prayed it earlier, when the pagan sailors were all praying to his God. That was probably the better time to do it, not when he's desperate and afraid that really he is going to die. And he prays a prayer of thanksgiving, and when it finishes, the fish vomits him up on the shore. 
And then to me, it's surprising the word of the Lord immediately comes to him again. I don't, I guess I don't believe in the God of second chances all the time. God didn't give up. And he said to Jonah, go to Nineveh and tell them what I tell you to say. And he just went. I guess he was convinced. And he gets there and Nineveh is so large it's going to take three days to walk across it. And he begins to walk. And he begins to declare the most pitiful sermon I have ever heard in my life. This sermon is worse than the sermon of the Samaritan woman. Do you remember we talked about how bad her sermon was not so long ago? She went back to her village and said, come and see a man who told me everything I've ever done. He can't be the Messiah, can he? And that pitiful sermon got the many people from that village to come and meet Jesus, and many of them were saved. Well, this sermon is so much worse, you know. This sermon goes like this, and this is it. Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's it, folks. No more. Like that would catch anybody's attention or make anybody want to change. There's no beginning, there's no middle, or no end. There's no catchy little stories. Just 40 days more and none of us shall be overthrown. And I picture Jonah saying it like this. 40 days more and none of us shall be overthrown. Because he didn't really want them to hear it, right? And just think of what happened. Immediately, they believed his story. They believed. That's all it took. There were no cell phones then. There was no Twitter, no TV news. There weren't even any bullhorns. And word of that sermon swept across that city so fast that the whole city declared a fast and every last person in the city put on sackcloth and began to call out to the Lord. And it it included the king and they even put sackcloth on the animals. That must have been a sight. And because of their response, God decided not to bring calamity, and they were saved. You look at that and you say, well, Jonah must have been pleased. He didn't even try very hard. He must be a great evangelist. All it takes is a word, and they're saved. But but he's not pleased. He's mad. He didn't want them saved. And he prayed this prayer. It's an angry prayer. Oh, Lord. Is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That's why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning. For I knew, I knew that you're a gracious and merciful Lord God, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from punishment. He knew that. He knows God well. He knows our God well. And he goes on. And now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. And there it is again. He'd rather die than have those guys saved. He likes it that God's gracious, but he doesn't want him to be gracious to anybody. You know, um, he thinks they don't deserve it. You think about a Ukrainian being sent to Putin in Moscow. He thinks he doesn't deserve it. Wouldn't want him saved. He'd want him incinerated. Think about an Afghanistani woman, Afghani woman, being sent to the Taliban to declare the word of the Lord. They don't want them saved. They want them gone. I wonder who it is that we feel that way about. Who is it that we just dislike so much that we don't even want them saved? I don't know who that is. But I'll bet there's somebody for every person in this room. And Jonah went outside the city to pout. He built a little booth and he sat in it and waited to see if the city would be incinerated anyway. (laughs) You can always hope. Maybe God would change my God's mind again. And God made a little bush to come up to shade Jonah and it made him happy because it was a little bit cooler and it's as hot there as it is here. And the next day, the bush withered because God sent a little worm to eat it. And then a dry wind came and dried out everything, including Jonah. And Jonah said again, I just need to die. And God asked him this work, this, this simple thing. Is it right for you to be so angry about the bush? And Jonah said, angry enough to die. And God said, These words to Jonah and maybe to you and me. 
You're concerned about the bush. For what you did not labor and you didn't grow, it came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and are so many animals? And that's the end of the story. And it's not about a big fish. It's about God. We can choose to look at it from several perspectives. From Jonah's perspective, we can consider how we respond to God's calling. How did you act the last time you knew God was calling you to do something? I was a pretty good Jonah for a pretty long time. I knew God was calling me to be a pastor, and I tried everything else. I tried to be a social worker. I tried to be a counselor. I tried everything until I got it. And then I realized I was running to Tarshish. Not because I was rebelling, but because I didn't have the imagination to think that all I had to do was say, yes, God, and God would do the rest. Thank God God didn't give up on me, you know, for 15 years. God didn't give up on Jonah. And I will say to you, if God calls you to something, trying to do something else, it is not going to work. You can write that down. It's the truth, you know. Once I got it, I marched off to seminary, never looked back, you know. Jonah had a much harder thing. He had to march into a city knowing how they felt about him. They wanted him dead, and he had to walk in there anyway. It's not easy to do that unless you know our God. So I think we need to look briefly at at what the story teaches about God. And the first thing to notice is that God calls us sometimes to surprising things that may seem ridiculous. Why would you send a Hebrew into a city where they want to kill him. Why wouldn't you go get a Ninevite and convert one and then send that one back into the middle of it? It's just not the way God did it. We don't get to pick how God does it. The second thing to notice is that God journeys with us even when we are rebelling and refusing. God hung in and gave Jonah a second chance, and, and Jonah jumped at it. The good news there is God won't give up on you when you are trying to avoid your calling. And that's good news. And the third thing to notice is how absolutely extraordinary God's love is. God cares about those Ninevites. Can you imagine these fierce aggressors against God's children? And God cares about Jonah, the unwilling and the rebellious. Didn't leave him alone, pouting in his booth, praying for the Ninevites to die. He came and tried to coax him to God's point of view to see the Ninevites as people of value. God's grace is amazing. And I think the most important thing about this story is to notice that if God calls us to it, God can see us through it, and God will do it. Do you see that from this story? If God calls us to it, God can see us through it and will do it. Jonah didn't have to do a very good job. He just had to show up and do what God asked. Even if his heart wasn't in it, even if he didn't try very hard, once he opened his mouth, God did the rest. If we do what God asks us to do, God will do the rest. And you're thinking, well, God's not calling me to anything, and I'm thinking you're not listening, (laughs) because I think God is. When you get a nudge as you go into the grocery store for that person that's sitting there in the front looking really lonely, and your heart just goes out to them, and you say, I wish I could do something, I think that's a calling. And that's an invitation to, instead of walking on in the store, to walk over to the person and say something simple like, you know, Every now and again, God points out to me somebody who needs a prayer. And I think God might have pointed you out to me. Does that make sense? Is there something I can pray for, for you? And they may say, oh, no, I'm fine. That's fine, too. You did your part. God can do the rest. Because they know that God loved them enough to send somebody over to ask. You know what I'm saying? You don't have to be successful for God to be successful. And when God has put it on your heart to check on that neighbor next door who lives alone, who's had surgery, 
walk over there and knock on the door and say, you know, I just want to know that you're okay. Can I bring you dinner tonight? And if you're willing to do just that much, God can do the rest. If God calls us to it, God will see us through it, whether we want to do it or not. So my prayer for us is that we might have the courage to step out, even when we aren't sure we know what we're doing and don't much want to do it, and just trust in this God who always does know. Amen. Oh Lord, oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, we praise your name. Oh Lord, we magnify your name. Prince of peace, mighty God, O Lord God Almighty. O Lord, O Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. O Lord, O Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. O Lord, we pray. Mighty God, O Lord God Almighty. O Lord, O Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. O Lord, O Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. O Lord, how majestic is your name, we praise your name. O Lord, how majestic is we magnify your name, O oh Lord, we praise your name, O oh Lord, we magnify your name, Prince of Peace, Mighty God, O oh Lord God Almighty, Prince of Peace, Mighty God, O oh Lord God Almighty, I invite you to join me with an attitude of prayer. Creator God, thank you for the variety of ways that your Holy Spirit ever so gently nudges us, invites us to come. To come. Lord, at times we become so focused, our attention is just confused. We begin to focus so much on our excess baggage, perhaps on our current family divisions, or even in our own ways of thinking, the way we look towards other people. And we understand, God, that there are moments, there are times, there are seasons in our lives where you will use us you will, for that moment, invite us to be your instrument. Nevertheless, God, you continue to be God, our creator. And I am mindful of the words written in Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, which say, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me, begin with me, and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Because truly, God, if you call 
us to it, truly you will see us through it. We thank you for the word of wisdom and encouragement upon our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And God will raise you up on eagle's wings. Bear you on the breath of dawn. Make you to shine like the sun. And hold you in the palm of God's hand. Each week, we highlight an area of ministry. So you know where your gifts are being used. This week, we call your attention to the ministry of our Staff Parish Relations Committee. This group serves as the human relations team for our church. They discern the need for staff positions, write job descriptions, and submit them to the council for approval. They assist the pastors in advertising and interviewing candidates for a variety of positions. They have done a lot of this recently. They set policies and procedures for all of our staff members, submit salary recommendations to finance and consul, and serve as liaison between the appointed pastors, the church, and the cabinet and bishop with regard to appointments. Right now, they are preparing to evaluate each of our appointed pastors so they are ready for our annual meeting with the district superintendent on November 15th. They will fill out an appointment request form for each, indicating whether they believe it is in the interest of the church's mission to continue each appointment. Thank you for your gifts, which undergird the work of our SPRC and allow us to have a staff that works so diligently to fulfill our mission. Through their ministry, you touch many lives here within the church and many lives beyond the walls in the community and beyond. You are always touching more lives than you realize. Now please rise and join us in our song of praise. Oh God, you are And I will seek you in the morning, and I will learn to walk in your ways, and step by step you'll lead me, and I will follow you all of my days. Please remain standing as you are comfortable and join me in prayer. God of light and love, we are grateful for all you are and all you do to bless. With thankful hearts, we return a small portion of what we have given to us. We receive our gifts, our hearts, and our lives, and use them for your purpose, so that the kingdom might be more on your We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And now we offer the prayer, together the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
We now invite you to remain standing as we sing our closing hymn, God of Love and God of Power. Let's sing with joy together. morning. It has been so good to worship with you. Wasn't it unexpectedly fun today? Thank you to the to your whole family, Ken. We are so grateful for all three of you to be here with us this morning. It's been good to worship. If you're a newcomer, remember to stop by that welcome center just down in front of me and across to pick up a newcomer bag to take home with you. Just a few things to remember. Don't forget we have two missions initiatives going on as you exit. You can drop your gifts into the white baskets for sandwiches for the homeless. That will go to senior citizens who are homeless who come to the Justice Center every day. They come there for respite from the heat and for help finding housing and jobs and meeting other human needs. We make lots of sandwiches and we need your help. You can also drop your gifts into the big water jugs for Circle the City, which is a mission to serve homeless persons who have faced a medical crisis. We'll be putting together kindness kits to give to those persons sometime in in October. And then plan to be here at 3 o'clock for the Performing Arts Coffee Cantata. It's free uh, at 3 o'clock, presented by Ken Gutenberger, his brother Bill, his sister Jeannie. You've now heard them, and you want to come back and hear them again, right? Uh, And we'll be serving Starbucks coffee, which was donated to us by Starbucks, so you can have a cuppa, and we're going to let you drink it in here. Don't tell the worship committee. They're probably not listening. You can enjoy great music and some coffee. Communion will be served here in the front uh, after the service, so if you would like to receive communion, just come down to the front after the service. Our prayer ministers are in place at the far ends of these front pews, and that's for anyone desiring personal prayer ministry. And finally, come have some coffee with us and some cookies over in the fellowship hall. We have a nice time of fellowship together. And now, receive the blessing. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Amen.